Hi, we're back with John White, legend in horse racing, and we thought we would dissect uh, Big Play's other incredible horse, who is headed to the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile this year, Seize the Gray. Now, Seize the Gray has had an incredible year, uh, and currently, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, John, he's up for a potential championship as a three-year-old. He's in the running, no question. Uh, a couple things have to go his way, but... His last race was the Pennsylvania Derby, and I thought we could watch it together and maybe discuss what you see in sure. Seize the Gray and, and maybe talk a little bit about him. So, Well, one of the best weapons for Seize the Gray is his, what you call tactical speed, where he can either be on the lead or just off the lead. And why is that important? Well, horses like Zinyanda that come from way off the pace, you know, that are like 10, 15, 20 lengths behind early, there's always the potential of running into traffic problems or uh, racing wide or both. And uh, so if you have that tactical speed where you can sit up there early, you're in the race and you can avoid a lot of those uh, problems. So this is one thing that Seize the Gray possesses uh, and is a big weapon for him. And it, he's used it to his advantage on a number of occasions, including the Pennsylvania Derby. Well, let's take a look over here. Um, now, one of the first things you want to look at is how he comes out of the gate. Is he a good gate horse? Because there again, and Bob Baffert's fastidious on off this. Off and racing in the Bet Parks, Pennsylvania Dirt. But you want to be able to get out of that gate and get into a, a tactical position right away. You know, In other words, you'd, if you break at the back of the pack and have to rush up, because he wants to be up there on the lead, and you can see he's the gray horse in the My Race Horse familiar black and white silks. And so he's saving ground. What we mean by that is if you race along the inside rail, you know how in track and field, when they run in lanes, how at the start, they're staggered. Because if you're out wide, you have, you're running farther, you know, farther. So th that's where horses that are out way on the track are having to run a longer trip. Sometimes there's been mechanisms to measure that. For instance, I'll have another ran farther than Bodemeister in the Kentucky Derby. Because I'll have another started in post-19, Bodemeister was in front and saving ground, just like sees the gray hair. And the other thing, now you want to look at the rider. Look at how he's kind of almost standing up on the horse. Now, what's impressive here is he's doing this so comfortably. And what you want from horses in a lot of cases, especially those with kind of the tactical uh, ability, to get in a good rhythm. You'll hear a trainer like D. Wayne Lucas talk about that. You want to see the horse get comfortable where he's just kind of rolling along, very nice, like going down the river, like a stream. That means there's a lot of energy. That Now, right here you think, oh my gosh, Seize the Gray is getting challenged. This is unmatched wisdom. He's all, he's like got a head in front. How How is Seize the Gray going to win this race? He won it because of what happened early. He didn't expend all that much energy early. He's got energy left in the race here. And look at, he puts away that horse, just swats him away like a fly. Look at that. <laughs> and so he's striding powerfully down to the finish. But where he won the race was not here in the stretch. It was in that run all the way to the far turn or the second turn of this two-turn race. So, uh, you know, he's a quality horse with a, one of the greatest trainers in the history of uh, not only thoroughbred racing, but quarter horse racing. I mean, D. Wayne Lucas, this guy is in the quarter horse. I mean, he's one of the greatest quarter horse trainers of all time and thoroughbred trainers, just like Bob Baffert. You see right here, if you were going to bet this race right now, you would bet on Unmatched Wisdom, who's in the green and purple there on the outside. I mean, he's clearly in front there. And Sees the Gray said, and this is where a horse can show heart too, which Sees the Gray obviously has some heart to him because he says, oh, no, you don't. You're not going by me. I'm putting you back away. So a very nice uh, performance, a very good ride there as well. As I say, step one, get out of the gate well. Step two, set the pace as comfortably, as easily as you can. Look at those fractions. See, 49 and change, 113 and change. A mile in a pedestrian 139 change. See, and this blunts the final time of the race, too. So people will be critical that he didn't win the race in a faster time. But that's fine because he's just as happy he won the race. It, he didn't have to set a world record to win. He just wants to win the race. And he did, and he did it by a daylight margin. So he deserves a lot of credit. The rider deserves a lot of credit. D. Wayne Lucas deserves a lot of credit. 
And once again, this ownership group, too. You're talking about my racehorse. These guys have made a tremendous impact on the scene in a relatively short period of time. And I have friends that have owned shares of horses in these My Racehorse horses, and they're as happy as clams. I mean, these guys, they just, and it's so wonderful for this sport. The more people we can get interested in horse racing, the better for horse racing. That's kind of obvious, but, you know, it, so look at how, look at the clapping. Look at all those people. Look at that. I mean, this is something they'll remember their whole lives. They're not going to forget this. Look at that. And, and it's so much fun. Look, in horse racing in the United States, in the whole first part of it, you had big, powerful owners that were one person, basically, you know, like Calumet Farm was Warren Wright, and I mean, which was like the New York Yankees, and they were a dynasty. But it's, tell me how much more fun it is. Warren Wright was, ha of course, happy to win these races. But how much fun to share it with 20, 30, 40, 60, 80. They can't even get them into the winner circle for the, a lot of these races. So, I mean, it's just a wonderful uh, new development in this game. There have always been partnerships in racing. Not always, but uh, I formed a partnership in the Pacific Northwest in the 1970s. But I wasn't even first up there. There was a partnership in Seattle at Long Acres called Media Stable, and it was 20 people involved in the media, and they asked me to be a member, and I declined. I really, you know, I wasn't in Seattle that much of the year. I was on the other side of the state in Spokane at Playfair Racecourse, and so when I went over to Playfair, I formed Media Madness Stable, and that was eight of us, not 20, but that was eight of us, which at that time was a pretty big group. The 20 was really big for the 1970s, but, you know, we had a blast. I mean, you know, and it was so much fun to share that with these partners. I mean, it really was. I mean, it was like a day of going to a football game, you know, with a bunch of people and, uh, you know, where they, they tailgate and everything. And it was just, it was so much fun. And we, we had, we did well and racing's tough to do well. But that's another thing my racehorse has done. They've done very, very well. They, they've gone about their business in a very smart way and uh, provided a lot of memories to a lot of people. Well, John, that's a beautiful sentiment. And I guess one thing we can say is I'm sure there's a lot of my racehorse uh, owners that are hoping they do well with him at the Breeders' Cup. Uh, do you give him any chance to win the Breeders' Cup or perform well in the Dirt Mile? Oh, absolutely. I mean, he's certainly a contender in that race. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. I mean, He's, uh, you know, winning a Preakness in a Pennsylvania Derby tells you right then and there, and never count out D. Wayne Lucas. I don't care what situation that uh, master trainer is in. You have to respect him. He's pulled off some huge upsets in the game, but he he's just someone you can never count out. I've heard people through the years count him out, and they've been very, very <laughs> sorry to do so. And listen, I have a good friend that did that, but there's been many people for many years, you know, at one point in Lucas's career, his owners, you know, were up in age and he lost a few key owners. Uh, he revamped, he rebuilt, and he, he, he keeps coming back. And I mean, the guy is an amazing person. I mean, he's so smart. And uh, listen, the first time I ever met him, in the spring of 1981 and knew I'd have to be covering him on a day-to-day -day basis because he had a powerful stable of racehorses. And the very first day I go to his barn and his barn was a, just a, a show place. I mean, it was immaculate. I mean, every, right, so beautifully raked and the flowers and, and compared to some of the barns that were just, you know, run down and straw all over the place and flies buzzing and and I interviewed him about his horses, and then I was starting to walk off. And he said, uh, can you do me a favor? And I said, sure. He said, please don't write about my barn. I have enough people jealous of me because of how nice it looks. And, you know, I don't need any more publicity about it. And I said, fine. And not only did he not want me to write his barn, but he was so smart, he was testing me because it was my first day of meeting him. And he wanted to know whether he could trust me that if I said I will not write about that, I would keep my word. And that way he could trust me as a reporter and we would have a good relationship. And when I didn't say anything about how nice his barn was, 
he took that into mind and it helped me get off on the right foot with Lucas. So wow. but that's how smart that guy was. So a little detail like that, that he, he knew, and believe me, Ryan, I was going to mention that in the article I was writing. I was a columnist. That was going to be in the column. There's no question. I was going to say, and boy, this barn looks so nice and you can't believe. And But I did not do that because he asked me not to. And it wasn't that important, but I was going to throw it in there because it was something you did not see at that time. It's like Bob Bamford being kind of a, a new guy to use the walkie-talkie to talk to riders during workouts, and they laughed at him, and then a lot of trainers do it. Well, they kind of laughed at Lucas in the beginning of how nice his barn looked. Well, guess what? A lot of trainers now take the pride. And of course, so many of Lucas's assistants went on to be outstanding trainers, of course, led by Todd Pletcher, one of the top trainers of all time. And when you go to that Todd Pletcher barn, what do you think it looks like? And it'd be the same thing today if I went to Todd Pletcher, like I did D. Wayne Lucas in 1980, if I went to Todd Pletcher in 2024 and said, you know, asked him about this horse and that horse and this and that, I would be very prone to say, boy, what a nice barn he's got and everything. See, so I mean, because he's right cut from the D. Wayne Lucas mold. But it's that attention to detail. It's like the great coaches, like a Belichick. Those guys, you know, just little things that you think are little, but they're big to them and they produce results. And that's one thing about D. Wayne Lucas from the, the beginning in quarter horse racing to today in like with Seize the Gray. He produces and he wins races and he wins big races. And uh, he'll be doing that uh, as long as he's on this earth. Wow. Well, in a game of inches, it's great when those little details add up to the victory. And... Oh, well put. I like that. <laughs> and so we wish uh, Seize the Gray, our, one of our big play favorite horses, uh, lots of luck at the Breeders' Cup. John, thank you so much for your time. This is exciting. Oh, great, Ryan.